and I'm Wolfwood with a zero on Twitter. If you want to talk about this, hit me up. So great new operating system in the sky is a fantastic acronym if you are in 1975 deciding that you are going to change the world and basically give us a vision of cloud computing uh, from the era before consumer dial-up even exists. So these folks wanted to build something that was multi-tenant uh, and had a utility computing model where you would you know, connect to the machine, run processes, pay for your usage in terms of memory and CPU, and um, you know, completely have a service model instead of the upfront pay for a machine, um, spend a lot of money whether you use it or not model. So uh, actually went into production in 1983 and was in production for at least 10 years. Um, so a couple factoids because they just have these fabulous things in the abstracts of papers and you feel like I have to tell people about this. So they uh, supported actually running unmodified binaries from other operating systems instead of saying, hey, uh, we have this wonderful thing and you are all going to now write software that runs on our operating system, forget your old operating systems. Nobody wants to do that. So they actually came up with ways to run, uh, for example, existing Unix binaries um, and did this without the help of hardware virtualization support, which we have today. Uh, it also was ported to a number of different processors, um, which is part of supporting different operating systems because back then there was a little more coupling between uh, your OS and your hardware. Um, and the big thing that we're going to end up talking about is this idea that you can pull the plug on the running machine. They would do this as a demo at conferences. Have a running machine, there's your terminal, somebody is editing some text, walk up, pull the plug, plug it back in, bam. Terminal's back, right in the middle of the document you're editing, good to go within 30 seconds. Um, and they achieved very high utilization of their disk bandwidth, um, and we'll talk about how that happened, but basically, um, by rethinking the way that we use our memory and storage system, we reshape the way that uh, our workloads to the disk happen. And then, of course, it was small. And uh, as we heard in another talk, being small isn't necessarily a good thing. Also, I am bad at zeros. Um, <laughs> and it used very little RAM, but uh, we will find out why in a second. Um, when you have a stateless microkernel, sure, your kernel is small. It doesn't do anything. Uh, big surprise. So billing is actually part of the operating system. I, I don't know that it actually sent you, you know, a letter saying you owe us this much money, but it kept track of resource utilization in a way that could be used to bill customers for CPU and uh, storage use. Um, they wanted, you know, uninterruptible service because now you are giving people a service, you're not selling them hardware, uh, their reliability requirements tend to go up. Um, and they were very focused on this idea that they were really going to have adversarial users um, and you needed to secure resources in a way that other users weren't able to access them. You needed to multiplex everything because nobody's gonna have direct access, it has to be shared among all the tenants. And uh, it needs to be extensible, which primarily came out in terms of implementing all of these different operating systems interfaces. Uh, so the foundations of how they achieved this, the first one was, as I said, a stateless kernel. So um, it's a little hard to imagine what is the kernel doing if it has no state, but uh, it's mutating state that the processes have. So the kernel itself never has to allocate any memory, and this means that the kernel can't crash because you're out of memory. The kernel can't hang while it's waiting to read a page from disk. Um, similarly, they decided to go for unbuffered message passing, which means that if you try and send a message to a process and it's busy, it can't receive the message right now, uh, it returns to you and it's your job to kick off a timer or something else and decide to talk to it again in the future. Or maybe decide that if you can't get a response right now, that is an error and you're gonna error out the operation. Um, but it's up to the caller to figure that out instead of being on the uh, responsibility of the kernel or the responsibility of the callee to figure out what to do with a message when um, there's no time to deal with it right now. So they also embraced this idea of capabilities. Um, I don't wanna say that they invented it, but I also can't think of a capability system that came before that. I'm sure maybe someone will come up to me and straighten me out uh, at the break. Uh, 
but the idea here is that the name of your resource and the access to the rights to that resource are all combined in a way that you don't have direct access to. You can't you know, edit this because otherwise you could give yourself uh, root privileges. But that by having the name of something that gives you the right to use it, maybe it's read only, maybe it's read write, uh, but you call a kernel and you say, hey, read data from this file. And what you're really saying is, hey, uh, I have access to this page and you should give me the data that's inside of it. Uh, and then finally, this idea of a single level store, I like calling it persistent virtual memory. Uh, other systems have called it orthogonal persistence. But really, um, the way that they achieved the reliability fundamentally came from this idea that all processes exist um, forever through space and time. And so if you pull the plug, if everything explodes, whatever, nobody cares, because it's all persisted on disk and we can get it back. Um, and we're not really going to talk about much of their abstractions, but uh, so they call a process a domain. They call an address space a segment. And I just wanted to show you they got really excited about the idea of object-oriented programming. So here is our Unix process. Uh, let's use the laser. So our Unix process decides that it's going to make an open system call. And that will fault and get trapped by the Unix keeper process, which is this Unix emulation. Um, and then that is going to send it to the inode for the directory that you are, that the file you're opening lives in. And so this is an inner process communication message. Then that uh, inode is actually a process that's running. It has its own code. It has its own data. It's going to send a message to its B tree, uh, which is a collection of the inodes that it contains. A message goes to that inode domain, and the inode says, oh, OK, you know, you check out. You have good permissions, whatever. Maybe you don't. And a message then is passed back through this call chain. And here is where the idea of a capability comes in. I can return a capability, which now allows this Unix process, well, maybe not the process directly since it's not aware of the capability system, but the Unix keeper to store that capability in the process table. And that says, I now have the name of the inode directly, which means that I can send messages to it directly, and I have the right to do so. So it combines naming, locating, and access checking all together. And so that's how they get this multi-tenancy as well. If you don't know the name of something, there's no way for you to talk to it. So the fact that I'm running literally on the same machine as my competitor is no problem because I don't know the name of any of their stuff. I can't go get it. There's no way in the system for me to forge those. Those capabilities are all hidden from you. So you don't have um, any direct access where you could kind of fake up or guess what somebody else is naming things. Um, so before we talk about persistent virtual memory, let's talk about what virtual memory is. Um, basically, the OS allocator, somebody's allocator, is going to give us a bunch of random pages. We're going to make them look like a nice linear address space for our process. Virtual memory is how we do this. Um, on the other hand, file systems are completely different because they manage disk instead of memory, and we call it an inode instead of a page table. Um, but Basically, it's the same thing. And to muddy the water some more, uh, we have swap, we have suspend. Turns out memory ends up on disk a lot more often than we might think. Um, swap is how we allow processes to use more RAM than we have physically available in the machine. Although it turns out that unless you have really nice access patterns, as soon as you do so, you instantly regret it and you never want to do it again. Um, we also have suspended disk. And this is the part in the slides where I get really paranoid and say, oh my god, you could just do this all in Linux. We already have all of this. You can suspend your laptop. Uh, but there are plenty of good reasons why Linux's suspended disk model is not really the same as what we're talking about here. One is that um, there is this separation of the idea of what's in memory and what's on disk. And so that means that you have the serialized version of data on disk. You have the deserialized version in memory. In Kikos, there is no such thing. There's no need to ever serialize or deserialize a data structure. It just exists, and it exists forever. Um, it's also not really optimized. I mean, for me, suspend probably takes 30 seconds. Can't do anything. It's probably not what you want going on uh, every five minutes on your system. And finally, because Linux is not a stateless kernel, it means that there's coupling between the kernel code and the kernel state. And so, for example, if I upgrade my kernel, suspend my machine when it comes back, 
Grub boots my new kernel, there's no way for it to read the old suspended image and I end up losing uh, my hibernated, hibernated image. So it's, it's still a little different uh, and we'll talk about why. Um, so really for me, the idea is that disk takes primacy over RAM. All memory pages, when you call an allocator, instead of being allocated in RAM, they are allocated on disk. They have some home location where they live. Now they might temporarily live in RAM. You know, that's nice, handy when you're trying to access things to have them go at uh, the speeds of loads and stores to DRAM instead of have them go at disk read speeds. But that's uh, not something that the process is ever aware of, needs to know anything about. It's all happening transparently as an optimization for you. Everything lives on disk. So in addition to these home area, this home area where all of your blocks are allocated, we also have two swap areas. And these are where uh, our last checkpoint of the system lives and our next checkpoint of the system will live. So let's talk about what happens when we take a checkpoint. Um, all processes are, are temporarily halted. And this sounds bad, you know, stop the world is not something we like with garbage collection. We definitely wouldn't want that with checkpointing, right? Well, it's kind of something that you need to have happen because this is how an operating system gets registers and your instruction pointer into memory so they can save it. So um, it is a necessity in a way. Maybe you don't want it to happen to all your processes at the same time. Maybe it would be nicer if it was staggered, but it's gotta happen. Uh, then we mark all modified pages as copy on write and we have lots of fun um, page fault tricks that we can do to try and make this speedier. Maybe you set the bits on the very top of that page table and then they trickle down as faults occur to try to avoid spending a lot of time walking page tables and simply marking dirty pages uh, to fault. But one way or another, we need any dirty pages to fault uh, when they get an access because before they can be further modified, we need to copy them out to disk. So once we have everything set up so that they'll cause faults, we can start those processes back up, continue moving, and now we just copy all of our dirty pages to the next checkpoint area. Um, and if you know, a copy on write does happen, we're actually copying to disk the old version of that page the new version of the page will actually end up in the checkpoint after this. So those modifications uh, are separated because some happened before the checkpoint, logically some happened after the checkpoint. Um, and finally, when the checkpoint completes, the, the roles of the swap areas are reversed. The one that you were just running to now is the last stable checkpoint that is real data on disk. Uh, if your system crashes, that's where you'll pick up. And then the new area is basically uh, invalidated and that is where the next checkpoint will live. And finally, we have to migrate those pages from the checkpoint area back to their home locations uh, because they can't live in the checkpoint area forever. So this migration phase uh, can happen at a very low priority. It's not competing, well, it is competing uh, for resources obviously if you have very intense write workload. Um, but because of the way that the system is structured, it tries to avoid having any demand writes uh, to the disk at all. So really you just have to worry about your read workload. And so as you're scheduling the reads that you would normally have to that home area, you can also be doing writes along the way. Uh, there's a nice paper about kind of opportunistic scheduling like that. Um, and we can order those reads and writes that we're doing, reading from the checkpoint area, writing to the home locations, so that they're minimizing latency. We're, we don't wanna be seeking the arm of the disk back and forth across the platter. We like to write a bunch of things that all live next to each other uh, before we move on somewhere else. Uh, now, unfortunately, this migration does have to complete before we can do our next checkpoint. And it turns out that you can play with kind of the size of the checkpoint area and how often you take checkpoints uh, to pick a nice, um, relationship where it's unlikely that you will ever be ready to take a checkpoint uh, and not have actually copied everything out of the checkpoint area. But if you do, uh, we can just increase the priority of that workload, speed things up, get that checkpoint done, or get that migration done, move on to the next checkpoint. Uh, so now if we wanna restart, one thing to note is that page tables are not actually persisted in the system. Um, what we are persisting are kind of the capabilities that allow you to access certain pages. And those uh, capabilities are structured kind of like a page table, but they are not the machine data structure. They're some OS structure. Uh, 
So the OS has to read those and rebuild page tables when it boots up to give you access to memory again. Um, it also doesn't really need to fisk the system or anything like that. Um, so the nice thing about this is that if you're in the middle of copying a file, because your checkpoint has both data and processes, you will still be in the middle of copying that file when the checkpoint resumes. Things will continue as they are. You can't have a lot of the um, consistency issues that file systems engineers spend a lot of time worrying about. Um, they also kind of hedge their bets and say, well, we check kernel data before we checkpoint, and so it's very unlikely that you would take a checkpoint uh, that is corrupt and unable to be used. Um, that, that is a concern, but again, because you have a stateless kernel, uh, the kernel itself is very hard to throw off. It's more likely that you would corrupt a single process, uh, which is still bad, but it's not going to wreck your entire system. Um, and now the other piece of this that, um, as I dug into it, was maybe a little unsatisfying. How devices are handled is not really standardized. It's up to the individual device driver writer to come up with a way to handle restart. And so maybe they're going to persist um, device state to disk so that they can do that. Maybe they're just going to have a really good initialization routine that can kind of get you back to something resembling where you were. But uh, it's really up to the device driver to figure that one out. Uh, and finally, we have this, you know, we live in a networked world. We get network requests. Uh, if we lost those, uh, we would be sad. So any network requests that you got in the past five minutes need to end up in the checkpoint as well. And it turns out that you can do that. You just throw a journal into that checkpoint area as well. And so this is going to be a synchronous write. Um, it has a lot of locality because it's going to that checkpoint area. It's not scanning all across your disk, so you can do it reasonably fast. Uh, and then recovery from those checkpointed blocks is kind of up to the application. So the application needs to know about it, and this kind of violates their idea that this whole persistence mechanism is completely transparent to the user because this is one case uh, where you do need to know about it. Now, if you're writing the kind of application that requires journaling as a network server or something, uh, maybe that's a step above you know, the average application running on the system, and so it's okay that it requires a little bit more work to get it to go. Um, and they have a nice abstraction built on top of things to try and get us uh, basic commit abort protocol without having to engineer something yourself. Um, they also support mirroring, kind of RAID style, and um, you can load the system all out to tape, and this is how they actually distributed it, kind of like a live CD, except uh, it's a tape. So, you know, the effect of all of this and what really excites me as somebody with a background in storage is um, the workload shaping aspect. So all of your checkpoint writes are sequential. Your journal writes are going to the same checkpoint area. They're all sequential. And so this is a lot like a large structured file system, Waffle. Um, we use level DB. You know, these append-only systems where you're trying to get nice characteristics for your write workload to be very fast. Um, but it doesn't have the same downsides of something like a log structured file system um, because you are doing the migration kind of constantly instead of waiting until your disk is full, uh, you end up having nice locality for your reads as well. So in that home area, if you're doing allocations well, you'll have a contiguous location of the blocks for a file, let's say, and so you'll be able to read them sequentially uh, very quickly. Um, All right, so I'm running out of time here, but I think that there's a very interesting relationship between this idea and the process model for something like a mobile application um, because the mobile application is really expected to behave as though it is persistent. And the OS can say, I need your RAM, I'm gonna kill you. Uh, you need to persist yourself and all of your state to disk very quickly. Well, it turns out that if we had uh, kind of this persistent virtual memory model, then all of that would actually be just provided by the OS for the application, it wouldn't need to do any special work. Um, and there's also some things that we can talk about at the break if you're interested in relationships with new emerging uh, storage technologies that could work very well with this persistence model. Um, and if you're interested in playing with this stuff, SEL4 is kind of the state of the art when it comes to stateless microkernels. Thank you. <laughs>